Again, my name is Lynn Adamson. I'm co-chair of Climate Fast, and I'm here with a whole team of Climate Fast to bring you the workshop tonight. We have Mike Layton, our councillor, Mike Layton, and we have uh, Catherine Tate from Toronto Environmental Alliance. So we'll be starting our program very shortly. Uh, but before we start, I'd just like to do a land acknowledgement. So I'm going to call on Val Endicott, a member of Climate Fast, to um, share the land acknowledgement. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this evening, I wanted to reflect, reflect very briefly on the practice of doing a land acknowledgement. For me, it's an opportunity to meditate on the now familiar words. This land, long inhabited for 15,000 years, in fact, this land and these waters, the ancestral home of nations like the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, the Patoon, and others that I know personally so little about. This land, the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. This land that we live and work on is the land that the settler government believed it purchased, but that Indigenous nations thought they were sharing. Land acknowledgements give us pause to remember that we all, uh, that we have all around us today the leadership of Indigenous people, holding the line against ecological destruction and offering wise stewardship of the earth. Land acknowledgements give us pause to acknowledge that equity and justice and the work of reconciliation are urgent. Here are two opportunities uh, to take action. One is to simply sign up for the newsletter of the Indigenous Land Stewardship Circle here in Toronto. This is a circle of elders, knowledge keepers and community members who've come together around a shared commitment to healing in Indigenous lands and community here in Tecoronto. High Park's oak savannas are dish with one spoon wampum lands where their ancestors conducted ceremony, grew gardens, hunted and foraged for food and medicines. They're working with the City of Toronto and other organizations uh, to create opportunities for Indigenous leadership in the restoration of the High Park uh, oak savanna. Another opportunity is to learn more and support the work of Raven, which is an Indigenous led organization that helps with uh, Indigenous legal battles that they sadly have to uh, fight. I, and so just today I got across my desk an email that explained how it is that uh, they're teaming up with a group called Stop Ecocide Canada to host a new webinar uh, entitled Environmental Racism, A Story of Colonialization and Ecocide. So I'll put both of those details um, in the chat. Uh, there are opportunities to participate in this very long and difficult process of reconciliation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Val. Okay, so I was just gonna start with a very short, um, brief background as to how we came to be doing the kind of lobbying and deputation work that we are doing at, um, at City Hall. So it's a little bit about Climate Fast, just a few slides, and then we'll go into the background and presentations for tonight. Okay, let's see if I can share screen. Okay, so Climate Fast was founded in 2012, and we started by working at the federal level of uh, government. And, and um, there we were on Parliament Hill, and we fasted actually for 12 days the first year in uh, 2012 when we founded this. And between 2012 and 2015, we had a campaign of asking um, federal MPs and candidates for MP when the 2015 election came uh, to commit to three asks in our pledge, which were carbon pricing, support renewable energy and end fossil fuel subsidies. And we did get pledges from 130 um, MPs, and that is one of them. But in 2015, we found out that the city was going to start a program uh, called Transform TO. And since 70% of emissions 
come from cities and, and Toronto was Canada's largest city. We wanted to work with Transformed Heal from the very beginning to develop a really strong program and just lead the country in showing how emissions reductions can happen uh, and be part of a global movement because we know it's urgent. Uh, we have to cut emissions fast and sometimes at the city level is the best way to do it. So we participated in a lot of uh, consultations for the first couple of years, helped to organize some of them. We did public meetings. When we could get together in public, <laughs> that was a, a good thing to do. We had a couple hundred people at this meeting um, to raise the profile of the development of this program, Transform TO. Um, we did a lot of public engagement in terms of, of petitions. Um, because at city hall meetings, you can bring a petition and register it into the record and it shows public support for the item. We did film screenings and we did those in all neighborhoods of the city so that we could develop our list in the many different wards. And we did actions at city hall, it was possible to do this, it was 20, 2017, I believe that we, we had the Valentine's Day um, uh, campaign. Um, and we invited all sectors of society to get involved. So the, these are some students that came with their teacher, uh, James Natsiger, down to City Hall to depute. I know, Mike, I think you were in the room when they, they came down that day. So we wanted to show that this is about the future, this is for the children. Um, and we wanted to introduce the children to City Hall. We, did, we have done training and letters to the editor. We're not trying to cover that one tonight, but at another time, we may do that because uh, it's a very useful skill. And we will talk tonight a little bit about speaking with your counselor. Uh, most constituents don't do that. So when you take the time to do it, it can really make an impression. Um, and we, we've done deputations when they could be done in person. They're done in different parts of the city. And so this was a York Civic Center deputation day. Um, and sometimes there've been as many as 50 percent of deputations have been on climate or have touched on climate, which is, is really makes an impression on the councillors. And here was our pledge campaign. The second, the first year we did not get full funding of Transform TO. The second year we started a um, pledge program to uh, fully fund Transform TO. And so the second year, I think that was 2018, the, uh, the program was fully funded and that's the budget chief holding his signed pledge. So. We've used different methods to, to bring this forward. And we just believe that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. And that's what we are. And uh, thank you for um, sharing in that little bit of history. So um, yeah, <laughs> this is why how we've come to the point. We're, we're now working with the Toronto Climate Action Network, which has a municipal um, committee that meets uh, regularly to plan uh, what we can do to, to influence actions at the city. And right now the focus is on the budget. Um, Catherine Tate of Toronto Environmental Alliance has pulled uh, that group together and will be doing a presentation tonight. And, um, and of course, Mike Layton has, has been absolutely right at the front, forefront of bringing climate actions to the city and helped us get the um, decision for the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty that ha happened in July and helped with, not just helped, I mean, absolutely the forefront um, for the net zero planning and has just been pushing the city all the way along for many years now. And so it's uh, with great pleasure that I introduce Mike Layton to um, start our first presentation tonight. Over to you, Mike. Well, thank you very much, Lynn. Um, yeah. it, it is a, a pleasure to be here and in speaking with you. Um, I think most uh, importantly because of the last quote that Lynn put up, uh, I am a firm believer that if we organize for political change, we can achieve it. And I, I say that as, as an elected official, but also a student of political and, and, and climate activism. Uh, and then um, I played a, um, uh, I, I was a staff member at Environmental Defense Canada when we um, helped pass things like the uh, Clean Water Act and the Green Energy and Green Economy Act, um, as well as a couple other pieces of legislation provincially um, 
that uh, I'd like to think help push the city and the province in the right direction. And we did that through mobilizing community organizations, individuals, getting them speaking with their local officials, with their peer groups, uh, and getting um, doing exactly what the uh, tobacco lobby, exactly what the um, anti-climate or climate deniers have done, and that's organized around uh, uh, around the media and around politicians in order to ensure that uh, the, the correct set of facts was coming forward. Um, there's a saying that I think it, it, it predates President Biden, but he's credited for it for some reason. And it goes something like, show, show me your budget and I will show you your priorities. Um, it holds true, right? What you spend your money, your limited resources on is what you care about. Uh, unfortunately, uh, for many years, and I, 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 I would hesitate to say this year, but I, I, I will, um, our, our budget has been dominated by, I think, a lot of things that, um, while, while some may be well-intentioned um, and good and positive things, it's missing some pretty key components. Um, and that has really to do with a political trade-off around raising revenue and, um, uh, and, and, and investment and spending money on policies that, uh, that you want to invest in. I'm going to talk a little bit about the City of Toronto budget process first, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've seen in the budget, um, and then I'm going to end on sort of some teasers that might lead us to Catherine's, uh, uh, Catherine's uh, uh, presentation, which we haven't coordinated, so I, I have no idea if it's going to be a, a correct order or if she's going to duplicate a whole bunch of stuff I'm saying. Um, so I've served on the budget committee since 2014. And uh, before that, um, I was very active in the budget process when Mayor Ford was around, um, partly because he stacked the budget uh, committee with his own folks. And um, unfortunately, um, I think more damage was done in that time frame. but we did do a lot of organizing and actually got to the point that we convinced enough councillors to make investments that weren't otherwise in the budget. We managed to do that about every year. Um, I'm gonna say some numbers, it's scary. So the budget's about $15 billion. And um, that, that, that's our rate supported budget, Toronto Water, Toronto, uh, Solid Waste Management and the Parking Authority that, const that, that are about two and a half billion. And then a $12.5 billion budget, which is the rest. All the we call it the tax supported budget. Every year at the beginning of tax time, we start with an opening pressure. The assumption is, we have the same level of service in every division or the same cost pressures in every division from the previous year. And then we add on what the next year will cost. There's a, a large line item that's, that's, that's always the inflationary increase of the goods and services we procure and the increase in salaries for our unionized and our non-unionized uh, employees. And they're typically around a similar, uh, uh, a similar increase between those two groups, similar percentage increase. Um, it's not uncommon that that number is around $500 million, the starting pressure. $500 million, if we were to turn it around and charge it on people's taxes, would be about a 20% increase every year. So 20% on top of your existing tax bill every year. Um, that, of course, is much higher than the tax rate that, that, we, uh, that we pay on an annual basis. Um, and so there are mitigation strategies that the that that the um, uh, that the city manager always presents. It's the first presentation we get. They say, "Here's our pressure. Here's how we're going to cover it." Because we have to, unlike the other levels of government, and I, I guess I should have gone over this first. Unlike the other levels of government, we actually do need to pass a balanced operating budget. Um, so that means everything we spend in a given year needs to be balanced out with, uh, we, can't, we can't take on debt for those operating expenses. We can take out debt for our capital um, budget, which I'll get into in a second, um, but not for our operating budget, um, which is very different than other levels of the government who can go into hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars worth of debt any given year. Um, we, we cannot do that. 
So um, we, we're starting with a, um, a, an opening pressure of about 500 million this year, but there's an added pressure because of COVID. In the last three years, we've had an added COVID pressure at the beginning of the year of about 1.5 billion. So together, that's about a $2 billion um, hole in our budget that we have to somehow fill. Um, the expectation this year, as it was last year, was that the federal and provincial governments will collectively fill the COVID, specifically the COVID um, shortfall of 1.4 million. There is also an expectation that the federal and provincial governments, particularly the, the actually both levels of government will come and help us fill some of the other pressures. Um, one is about a $50, $50 million pressure um, uh, of uh, welcoming new Canadians and refugees to the um, uh, uh, to Toronto and in their settlement. And then one is a roughly $30 million pressure from our supportive housing, which is paid for by the province. But last year they paid for it. They paid for the increase in supportive housing uh, of only uh, $30 million and or $30 million, but only the one time, which means we're starting it as an operating pressure this year, which we do expect and the, and, and the city does expect the province will pay for. Um, there are also other balancing strategies uh, that, uh, that exist. One is, and it's important to distinguish this than a, a tax increase. One is the added revenue we get from the increase in the number of taxpayers in the city of Toronto. So with the growth in all the condominiums, we, we have, we, we don't, Every given year, the, the, if your property value goes up, which some of you may have seen with your MPAC assessment, your taxes go up accordingly, but they don't go up as an, an absolute number across the city. So if property, inc property values increase in a city um, of a billion dollars, we don't all of a sudden get that value more in taxes. Um, it, it comes out to zero based on the existing taxpayers. The added taxpayers, the when we when we take a commercial lot and turn it into a condominium, for instance, that is added revenue to the budget when we start adding people to the tax roll. Um, so there's oftentimes twenty to thirty million that come in the form of um, of additional uh, uh, additional assessed revenue from your taxes. Then there's the bit. Um, that it, it often the land transfer tax raises a little bit more every year. So that helps balance the 500 million. And then there's a tax increase that comes as well, um, or that, that is included as well to help balance out the 500 million. There's oftentimes they find efficiencies. You gotta be really careful when they use that word because sometimes it means um, service cuts. They'll often frame it as an efficiency that doesn't involve a cut. And that's where the budget committee need, we, we really do um, ask a lot of questions about why they think that cut won't impact the service that's being delivered. So, and then, so, so all that together, we're presented with a budget that's relatively close to balanced. In this case, we're balancing it based on the assumption the other two levels of government will give us about two, two uh, close to $2 billion, 1.5 plus a couple other things. So that's where we started. Um, there, they, the only way we currently have to pay for things in the budget is either a transfer from another level of government or um, fees that people pay for stuff, fees for service, um, things like building, uh, uh, building permits or applications that developers put in to, uh, to, to build a tall building. We, we charge them for, for us reviewing those buildings and then or, uh, reviewing those proposals. And then our property taxes and our land transfer tax. We do have a handful of other powers from the City of Toronto Act, but not many, um, not many that the city seems to be willing to use. We've introduced the vehicle registration tax on several occasions. It's actually on the agenda of the executive committee in the coming days uh, or next week um, for a review on the potential for a sales tax or the vehicle registration tax to be reinstated. Uh, we have examined tolls. Um, they're not the most politically popular thing in the world, but the city of Toronto supported it. Unfortunately, the previous um, provincial government shut it down and um, they have been seen as toxic ever since. And so any 
attempt to even raise them in conversation often get slapped down very hard um, by anyone else in, um, in, in the room. Um, I just wanted to vary uh, the, the, the distinction between, so, so what happens in the budget process? We are, last week, the budget was introduced where they give the overall brushstrokes of what the budget looks like. And then later that day, and this was on Friday, they released a series of briefing notes. And those briefing notes outline division by division, as well as our agencies, what their, um, uh, sorry, analyst notes. I already used the wrong word. Um, they, they outline division by division, uh, what they're looking to spend their money on, how big their complement is, what their, their internal pressures are year to year, um, or, or like the last year to this year, um, where they will be increasing their fees, uh, where there is new spending. So right at the end of all these briefing notes, a section that says new and enhanced. And that is a decision that was made earlier in the year or in a previous year by council that they are including in their, in their recommended budget for adoption. And then there's oftentimes a list right after that is, um, th that is not recommended, that is a council direction, but that's not recommended in the budget. There's surprisingly not many things like that this year in the budget. Um, but it's important to recognize that's normally where they put stuff that they don't want to yet spend. This is our city staff don't want to spend money on. So the last two days and tomorrow, the budget committee goes through division by division and asks information about every budget. We get some small presentations from some and we ask questions. Our last day is tomorrow. Um, over the course of the last two days and tomorrow, as well as our next budget meeting next Friday, we're able to ask staff for briefing notes. And that is a short report on a very specific thing where we want more information. I'm already getting the hook here. So I'm gonna to try to go through some of this really quickly. And then what happens is, sorry, next Monday and Tuesday are our deputation days where people come and get deputations. Friday's our budget wrap up day where we get asked for any last briefing notes. The following week or two weeks from then is when we have our last budget meeting where we make any changes to the budget, then it goes to executive committee and they can make any, they can ask questions and make any changes to the budget. Then it goes to council. All along that spectrum, you can be reaching out to city councilors um, or the mayor to try to make change happen. We have seen some small things change. Uh, oftentimes there's about $20 million that changes in the budget that gets added to the budget in that amount of time. And we find offsets for it, typically in the way of, um, of, of, estimating the income that we'll get from a source higher than it was previously indicated. Um, just a couple of things you should expect to see um, or outcomes that you can hope for in the budget. One is actually moving money into the budget, which does, like I said, doesn't all happen sometimes, but it's, it's trickier when you got a $2 billion um, shortfall in your budget. Um, sometimes you can move policy changes that while it's not new money, it's a policy that can be changed that can um, uh, uh, that can have a big difference. Sometimes you can tee up for future money. And, a, and an example of the last two is um, uh, for seven years, the Toronto Environmental Alliance and, and I tried to change some policy in the solid waste, in the what, Toronto water budget. And when it, it was about um, polluter, polluter pay, a polluter pays thing for sewage discharge. And for six years, I lost and I won on the seventh year. And so it made sense bringing it up every year. So that's the last point on like raising awareness of an issue can have payoffs later on, or you can be setting it up, setting up something to have a report back in the next budget that has a better chance of getting in then, or we hope get has a better chance of getting in. Um, some very quickly, some things that we've found in this budget as they relate to the transform TO. Um, and I'm, I'm sure Catherine will get into this a little bit more. There is an increase in spending on staff and the energy and environment office, which is a good thing. It's not new money in the budget. It's money that hasn't been spent in previous years because we've had a hiring problem during COVID keeping our staff levels high. We lost a bunch through attrition. We lost people um, uh, along the way who were just changing their lifestyle. And our we, we hadn't been investing in HR as much as we could. It's not only the environment and energy division that suffered, it's all across our corporation. Um, 
the the climate lens that's being used only on capital projects now it's really important that we uh, that, that we improve that as much as we can um, right now it's pretty much being used on any project that can be justified as climate related or resilience related um, a, a lot of transportation projects that are particularly climate friendly find themselves in that category somehow um, the um, the commercial real estate management division is the one that's going to be responsible for the capital budget for our own city buildings for bringing them up to a higher uh, or taking them to net zero we won't see what investment the city will be making until next year they're still doing an assessment um but we knew we knew that was going to be the case so it'll be the 2023 budget where it really matters um the transportation budget of course particularly around active transportation um so uh, Vision Zero, and I would say the cycling budget. Cycling budget does have an increase this year. Um, it's not an. It, 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 it's increasing the number of staff to implement cycling projects, but it also has a two, like a one point five billion dollar gardener, um, uh, gardener item that unfortunately it doesn't seem like we can change at this point, or it wouldn't save us any money if we changed it. Um, that uh, that eats up about half the capital budget for the next ten years from um, from. Uh, from transportation, forestry and ravines are two important ones that uh, to keep an eye on. Um, the, the ravines are seeing a clawback in the spending of litter picking in ravines. While I wouldn't consider that necessarily a climate project, it's certainly a, a, a natural systems related project. Um, but we need to continue to see an investment in forestry because in order to achieve Vision Zero, we need to achieve our our tree canopy target. There is a significant increase in investment in reconciliation and indigenous affairs, uh, which is welcome to see, something I've been working on for many years. Um, and then finally, uh, the TTC is one place that it's really critical. We we established today at committee through questions, Councillor Perks and then me. Um, the TTC has nowhere in their capital plan um, nowhere near the amount of investment that would be necessary in order for us to roll out the number of buses we need to achieve net zero and that the frustrating piece is if we don't start doing it now there's no chance of us doing it 10 years from now like we have to start actually moving pieces into place it actually has mostly to do with us finding spaces to store and and maintain the buses if we don't start doing that now there is absolutely no chance we will hit our vision zero target. Um, so that's something that I think we're going to have to see some movement on, movement on. I think that probably puts me at the end of my time. Um, I would say though that we have seen money change. We uh, the the climate fast and climate activists have done very well in the last couple of years of putting um uh, of putting forward the issue at deputations. We haven't seen as much movement as I like I would have liked to see on the on the political side. It's not for lack of trying. Um, but as that movement, as that climate voice grows, it will become um, it, it, it will become a greater force in moving money in the budget in the future. I have, I have no doubt. And so we should continue um, making it top of mind for budget committee members and the mayor. Thank you so much, Mike. That was so informative and you covered so many points. And I just want everyone to know that we are recording tonight. And so we will send you the recording link. So if you're working on your deputation over the weekend, you'll be able to listen to the points Mike has raised. Um, and we'll also have some additional analysis from T and whatever else we can add in uh, by Friday. We'll send, try and send it Friday morning for you. Um, uh, but that that was really, really fabulous. because uh, And this year we have to remember is an election year too, Mike, right? So by coming out and speaking to the councillors now, and if, you, if you're willing to make an appointment with and talk to your counselor individually as well, then you're really putting climate on the agenda. They're gonna know my constituents care. That's why we love that you're from all over the city because we have to, to reach out to different counselors. Um, so I know we had planned to have a couple of questions right now. Maybe we have time for one, I'm not sure. Um, Colleen, have you identified a question? Yeah, we have, we have at least eight. So I'll try to pick the, if we're doing one, let me see which one is the best. I think- Maybe we'll actually, do two. We'll do two questions. Okay. Go ahead. So, yep. All right, let's go ahead with the last question that was asked because I think this might help everyone. Um, what are the top three to five things you would like us to ask for? <laughs> okay, some of that's in what you just covered. 
so the recording will cover them. But do you want to highlight one or two things that people should really focus on, Mike? You muted Mike. We can't hear you though. You got to unmute. Yeah, if you can. Sorry, unmute. I can't. Thank there you. you Sorry about that. Um, just, just really quickly, and Catherine will probably touch on most of this uh, in in her presentation, or I hope she does. I would focus on the TTC, the need, uh, the need for us to position ourselves, not spend a ton of money this year, but position ourselves to be ready to spend the money and to start doing the work um, that that get us there. Um, I would say. Um, push on the acceleration of, uh, of, of funding and resources to, um, to an environment and energy office. While I, I don't think that we'll get it this year, again, I think it's something that they need to hear constantly that we don't mind if you spend money. Um, talk about revenue tools and your support for other revenue tools. Um, and, uh, and, and, and finally, I would say, um, uh, talking about um, the need for the city to be a, to to demonstrate our commitment in our own operations because that helps in a couple of different areas. It helps in green in our greening fleet, so spending money on new vehicles, big EV. Um, it's been, it, it it helps justify a larger financial spend in our existing buildings um, because in our existing buildings they've gone ahead and said um, we could uh, we could spend two million or four. And depending on how much uh, renewable energy we wanted to generate and how deep we wanted the retrofits, I would suggest that we go as deep and far as we can. Um, and uh, and they need to hear that, um, or else what's going to happen is they're going to come back saying, "Oh, I'm gonna spend two million because it sounds like the safe thing to do." Um, they need to our, our staff need to be aggressive. Counselors should be demanding the best, not kind of sitting back and thinking status quo is going to get us there because it's not. And that is in Northern Peru. I, I, um, I some of my wife is a birder and an artist. So someone commented about that. In the, uh, okay. Chat. All right. Well, thank you for that. And um, I'm just blanking out on the exact percentage of emissions and it probably it's not that exact, but approximate per percentage that's buildings. It's very high. Is it 50% and then 30% for transportation? It's maybe six, it's more, it's anyway, I think it's 55. I think it's 55% is buildings. So the retrofits, because 90% is existing buildings and 10% is new buildings. We need new standards for all of them, but we need the money to do the retrofit. We need the commitment to mass retrofits. So thank you for bringing that one forward. And the TTC is like the backbone of our emissions reductions in transportation. So that's very helpful. We have to stop using gas, basically folks, gas for driving and, um, buses and everything else, and also um, gas in houses. We need to convert using heat pumps and so forth. So there's lots we need to do. We need the investment and commitment. Thank you. So, um, sorry, yes, Catherine's going to be giving you all probably these same points. So I'm just going to stop uh, amplifying right now, but I'm just very grateful that, that you came tonight, Mike. And if you can stay for additional questions, please do. Um, I did say I'd take a second question though. Is there is there one that looks like it might be short? Yeah, actually, I'll just go okay. back to the first one. And they they are saying, um, how many of your fellow counselors work like you are doing to engage their constituents? And um, how, can you help us understand why more do not? So I guess it's about encouraging more engagement along the same line. <laughs> You know, I've hosted a budget town hall every single year since I was elected. I, I think I can count on one hand the number of counselors that have done that. I know because sometimes we do it jointly because it saves in staff time, but Councillor Wong Tan, Councillor Cressy, I know Councillor Perks, I think his was last night. Um, I think I, I maybe Councillor Fletcher. Um, I think that's it. I, some of them, on a given year, they might, um, but um, I'm not sure that, um, I'm just not sure they get it, right? Because like, the budget's really nuanced. You have a lot of counselors that say, yeah, we'd love to invest in that thing, but you know, taxes can't, can't have that. Um, like I'll probably tell everyone in my constituency that I have voted for higher taxes every single year that I've been in elected office. If you add them up, it turns into a really big number. But here's the thing, 
had everyone voted on the first year that I was a city councilor, had everyone voted for that tax increase, we wouldn't have had to have any of the other ones. Or we would have, but it just not, they wouldn't have been as dramatic. Um, because as we raise the, the, the rates, the taxes compound. We used to have, councilors used to be able to communicate this. It's, it's, it's not new that politicians are a little adverse to raising taxes, but in 2009, uh, then Mayor Miller, and he would have won again, uh, then Mayor Miller um, and most of the councillors, they all, like most of them won again. One didn't win that was running again. Um, they raised your water rates. It was called nine over nine. 9% every year increase for nine years. It ended up getting drawn out a little bit, more, but it's called nine over nine. I think that was the, 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 the rate. Um, that's a huge, huge amount. Like it wasn't 9% over nine years, like 1% a year. It was 9% every year. And that was because they wanted to deal with breaking and bursting pipes. And, and lead pipes and, and stormwater and flooding. But they managed to justify it. And by the time I was elected, which was the next year, and it was a like a it it was a later year in the increase, it's like it was two or three years in, nobody talked about it. People got their water bill, they paid it, they didn't think twice. It wasn't a media issue. I mean, you didn't say, wow, your 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 water bill is almost going up double digits. It just wasn't an issue. Yeah. It happened. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. I think it's the vision. People have to realize uh, the politicians have to realize that the vision is is there. People want that vision. They want that reality for our city and they're willing to pay for it. And during this election year is a really good time to kind of organize that kind of pressure and to look for who are the candidates that if they become councillor are going to actually be willing to do exactly what you said. So you do one increase and then it lasts. So we need that. And um we need the pressure on those counselors. So thank you. Um, okay, well, we're going to, to move on now, Mike. We have to, but we have the recording and we're very grateful for you coming. We're very grateful for all the work that you um, do at, at City Hall, putting these things forward. Uh, let's, um, you can all use your reaction button to uh, show some love for Councillor Layton. There we go. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for all okay. the hard work that you guys are putting into this. Bye yeah. for now. Okay, bye for now. Yeah. Okay, so now um, we're going to turn to Catherine Tate. Catherine um, is the climate staffer with Toronto Environmental Alliance. And um, we are very grateful for you for a lot of the work you do. You help to bring together the TCAN groups as Toronto Climate Action Network, for those who might not know that, which is an umbrella group for uh, more than 30 climate groups in the city. It's quite a large um, network. And uh, at, at TU you work full time and also with other staff to really understand what's in the budget and what can be done about the budget. Uh, and you also initiate uh, on the net zero, you initiated a digital action to help bring some of that pressure forward um, that we need to get the changes uh, we need. So over to you with, with great thanks, um, Catherine. Thanks, Lynn. I'll just ask, can you see my... Looks good. Yep. Good? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to concur with a lot of what Mike said, and I'm, but I'm going to do it with graphs. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think, Lynn, it was helpful to hear a little bit of the background um, leading up to this moment. I'm going to give a little bit of background as well. Um, because it shapes the way that we can advocate right now in this budget cycle. So we got our first transform TO climate policy back in 2016, and that transform TO version had a target of 80% emission reductions by 2050. Since then, we've had IPCC reports and the UN uh, code red for humanity, um, lots of, lots of um, you know, actual climate events, and then also advancing the climate science, telling us that we need to 
step up our ambition. So uh, 2019, there was the global climate strike with 10,000 people at city at a Queens Park. Uh, and then probably, yeah, Climate Fast was a signatory to this too. We had the open call for, for city council to declare a climate emergency. So we got the climate emergency declaration passed a council that was Mayor Tory's motion that Councillor Layton seconded. Um, so with that, we got a new target for zero emissions by 2050 and a study to see if zero emissions by 2040 was possible. And then COVID hit. So things were delayed by quite a bit. Um, it took is staff were redeployed, staff from, um, from environment and energy were redeployed to uh, help address the pandemic. So it took time to get that report back and then we just finally got it in November. So in November, we got the plan for zero emissions by 2040. Uh, and then it was just approved by council in December. So just a month ago. So, um, so there's a few reasons that that shapes um, that that shapes what we can advocate for right now, um, because we got this new pathway to 2040, but there's still a lot of planning to do around it. So it passed at council, and now um, we're in a planning stage again. So overall, our observations about the budget it seems to be a status quo budget. Uh, as Mike indicated, uh, we don't see a significant amount of spending as compared to 2021. There's a lot of challenges because of what I just talked about, and you'll see it in the following slides. There's a lot of challenges assessing um, climate funding in the 2022 budget. Um, and it doesn't seem to reflect this new step up in climate ambition that Council has just endorsed. Uh, and adopted, and um, uh, yeah, and Mike spoke too about the the revenue. Um, so we have all this, uh, you know, climate resilience, GHG reduction work that um, is literally going to have to transform TO, literally transform the city in a very short time, and we need to see the funding to be able to do it. So a couple of the challenges that we're seeing. So we have these new targets and the new targets mean new plans. So we have the new net zero short-term implementation strategy. So we've seen all of the actions, but we haven't seen a costed budget that comes with it. So there's a plan, but we haven't seen the budget for it. So we can't say whether the funds are in or out yet. And there was a supplementary report that passed. And um, that sounds like a very boring thing, but there was lots of great things in the supplementary report that passed it at December Council um, that are things that probably folks, a lot of folks in this meeting went and advocated for um, in advance of that council meeting. So we got, uh, we got annual reporting on GHG emissions, um, which we wouldn't have had otherwise. We wouldn't know how we were doing to our 2025 target if we hadn't um, advocated for annual targets. And we got a climate advisory group that centers equity deserving communities. We got support for resident led uh, climate action and engagement. Um, so, uh, resident-led and, and, and place-based um, resilience planning. And we got uh, an accelerated uh, implementation of the Toronto Green Standard. So there's quite a few things that we got in that supplementary report, but we haven't seen a costed plan for the things that got passed. So we can't say whether or not the funding is there for it. Uh, and then, so that's the short-term plan. And then the long-term plan also needs to be articulated. Um, so the, the graph in the right-hand 
upper corner here. This is this is a scenario that the technical modeling put forward uh, with reductions in different areas for how we can get to um, zero by 2040. But this is one scenario, and you know that the technical modeling consultant said, okay, these are the ways that you can get there. The city has to do its own work. The city needs to put together its own plan. Um, and that hasn't been done yet. We're also seeing, it's, it's good, but it's tricky. We're seeing climate action move way outside of environment and energy. So in a lot of past years, we would just look at the environment and energy division budget. And that's all we needed to evaluate to see the whole of climate action at the city. Now we see um, the short-term implementation strategy that's from this year till 2025 implicates 20 different city divisions. And the briefing note that I shared in the chat earlier on GHG reduction uh, and climate resilience spending implicates 21 different divisions and programs. So there's a lot of different places that climate action is showing up in the budget now. It makes it very difficult to assess. Um, and the last thing, which Mike already touched on, the climate lens is still in development. So this year it was a it was a questionnaire that was put to different parts of the budget to, to try to see which aspects of which projects had climate components, but it but in this total that they came up with, uh, 1.05 billion, it also includes non-climate components of projects. So, um, so there are things in there that we know aren't necessarily advancing climate goals that are being uh, counted in that 1.05 billion total. So this is what's different this year. So these are, these are some of the um, 21 different programs. Um, I'm not going to go through this. I just want to show, this is just to show how many different um, programs and uh, city divisions climate funding is showing up in this year according to the climate, according to the climate lens questionnaire that is being used. Um, so the climate lens questionnaire is supposed to be kind of a first step. It's not the climate lens that will be adopted, but it's like a, a preliminary step to adopting a climate lens that is in development. Um, but it's it's showing climate action in all of these different areas. And with this total of 1.5 billion, sorry, 1.5 billion that um, that we know includes non-climate components. So I would assume that those are things that are don't necessarily advance um, GHG reduction. So the graph on the left shows how rapidly we need to decrease GHG emissions. The graph on the right shows uh, the makeup of emissions currently, well, this is 2019 in the city. Um, so I'm showing that just to show, you know, that with the graph on the left, this is the, this is the pace at which we need to accelerate action. And, and the graph on the right shows us what areas we need to be spending on to be able to make that transformation. So without having costed plans yet for these new plans that were just adopted, it's great that these new plans were adopted. It's a big step up in our climate ambition, but it makes it difficult to assess whether we're on track or not. So what? So the methodology that we're using to see on an order of scale, are we on the right trajectory is by looking at the technical models um, that were part of the net zero strategy. So the technical modeling, um, had a financial aspect to it. 
So we're looking here, if you look at the graph on the, on the right, um, you know, we, we did lose time because of COVID. So we're trying to assess what year of this plan are we supposed to be in? We know that we lost time, but if we're in 2022, um, you know, this, the technical modeling shows that we should be somewhere around eight, $9 billion worth of investment per year. Whether that would all be reflected in the city budget is difficult to say. Maybe there's funding assumed here that's coming from other orders of government, private investment, other sources. But if so, explain. We need to know. We need to know if we're spending on the right order of magnitude to address the problem. Um, so what we see in transit, oh, and then, and then, you know, if we did lose a full year because of COVID, we can still look to this graph and see, okay, well, so maybe we're not meant to be spending 8 billion or 9 billion in 2022 if we've lost a year and we need to play catch up, but we should be at least 3 billion this year. Um, so the technical report also shows us, so we see so we see this year um, in that briefing document that I shared, it says that there's 358 million for transit that is, that's been marked as uh, climate impact funding in transit. But what the technical modeling shows us is that we're supposed to be at a level of 1.5 billion towards transit every year, every year. So that's a big shortfall. Um, in buildings, we're supposed to be at a level of 5 billion. And what that briefing note says that we're spending is 170 million. It's difficult to assess because it's, a few, it's across a few different areas of buildings and housing. But from, from what we can tell, it's not on the right order of magnitude of spending. In the operating budget, we spoke about staff. We're asking whether this is enough. Um, transitioning the entire city, uh, you know, we need to touch every building. We need to, uh, we need to invest so much in, in transit. And it's an enormous planning uh, endeavor to undertake. Is 103 positions enough? We don't know. Um, yeah, it's hard to assess. Um, as Mike said, there were, there were not enough staff last year. Um, and we don't want that, we don't want to see that repeated year after year. We want to make sure that all of those positions are staffed this year, at least, if not more. Um, so we already talked about budget and the short term implementation actions, we still need to see a cost of plan to know whether there's enough funding in there. So this, I'm just zooming in now on this graph that I shared from the technical modeling. So, um, so this on the left, we're seeing what the level of spending should be according to the financial model in the technical report. And then on the right, uh, there's a black line on that graph, and that just shows uh, the net annual cost. So yeah, the things that we're trying to assess really are what year of the plan are we considered to be in? And we're hoping that this is a question that Mike is going to be able to get an answer to at the um, at the budget review meeting tomorrow, the one that the, the YouTube link was shared in the chat. Uh, and then the other question, of course, is, you know, are there, is there funding coming from elsewhere to cover this? So knowing that we're gonna get, hopefully we're gonna get answers to some of those questions uh, tomorrow. What we know is that from the, from looking at the technical models, which is all we have to go on at this point, um, that the the order of magnitude is not right. Like the what's in the budget is not matching our our climate ambitions. So 
We want to see increases to funding, especially in housing and transit. And then we want to see uh, in the budget process, we want to see better engagement. I saw that Zoe commented in the chat earlier about that. It was a really good point. Um, we're getting this budget at a very late stage. Uh, and it's it's very difficult to review and assess for members of the public in such a short time. Uh, we want to see better equity assessment on the budget notes. Um, we want to see the climate lens improved, which Mike talked about, and I I agree. It's um, it needs to be more robust. The and then we've lost transparency and accountability. It's really really good that transit action, or sorry, that um, that climate action is moving into lots of different parts of the budget. So that it's seen in all of these different departments and divisions um, that I showed in the earlier slide, but we still need to be, we need to be able to assess if we're on the right track in terms of actions and spending um, and what we're achieving. So, as climate action moves into all these different divisions, we just need the city to explain and do more to, um, to summarize these investments so that we are, so that we can properly assess. Uh, and then we want the city to adopt fair and equitable revenue sources to fund these investments in our future. And then this, my last slide is just a, a plug for deputations. This was um, in that supplementary report that I mentioned that outlined, uh, well, that came back to council with a lot of things that um, that folks had deputed for um, and with staff recommendations to adopt those things that a lot of people spoke about. So this is just some of the things that we got, but we got the new 2040 target. Uh, lots of us went and deputed and asked for that target to be adopted. We got the new interim target. We got uh, the acceleration of the Toronto Green Standard. We got a faster a report back on faster phase out of fossil fuel for energy systems. We got the climate advisory group, which I think will be a very helpful thing in the future, um, advocating for, for climate action. And then we got those annual reports, which are going to give us good benchmarks to know if we're on track. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, uh, yeah, you can leave that slide up for a second if you like, so people can, can read it. Um, you've given us so much. And I just want to say to folks that don't worry about absorbing every detail. You do not have to be the most informed person. Remember that um, different deputants will take different points. So you want to pick a point that matters to you. Um, and you want to have maybe a figure or two on that particular point. But don't worry about understanding the whole uh, thing. And even if you just want to say, look, I'm just here to say that I care about climate. This matters to me and I want to see it properly funded then you've, you've made a contribution. So don't, uh, don't be overwhelmed. Like there's as much detail as you wanna get into, but you don't have to get into it. Your, your voice is quite valid um, with the level of understanding that you uh, are confident of. And um, we will have small breakouts in a few minutes, in about 10 minutes um, uh, with coaches. So you have 15 minutes to think about um, how you might like to do your deputation and uh, ask a few additional questions. We will be sending you a follow-up letter with more information and links. But the main thing is to, to hone in on what you are particularly concerned about and want to raise. Um, we're just going to take a couple of minutes for questions. Um, Catherine, you want to add something there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just yeah. wanted to add, so, so Mike had spoken about the possibility, the limited possibility of moving money at this phase of the budget. And he said, you know, money can move, we can advocate for that. And then there's also policy asks that we can make and, um, and things that tee up future actions. So yeah. after the information session tomorrow, we're gonna be putting out a briefing note that I've, I've told you that we're looking for funding in transit, funding in housing and the action areas that we're gonna look at, but we're gonna 
get more specific after tomorrow's uh, budget review meeting. So we'll release that for anyone who's preparing a deputation um, with some with some very specific asks that we that we think um, could be strategic. Yep. And there's a question in the chat about um, submitting your deputation by email, and you can do that. The um, the address is buc at toronto.ca for the clerk of the committee. That's also in the the uh, written material that we've emailed out to folks. And we'll also go through in a, in a couple of minutes um, how to do your deputation. So, I, I, Colleen, do you have a question for yeah, um, Catherine I, specifically? Okay. I do have three that they're short, I think. So let me just, um, okay. that I think are, are pertinent. Um, and the first one, and I think clarity around this might help, is we're asking for funding, like to fully fund Transform TO net zero strategy, but are we also able to request additions to the strategy at this point? So that might be a short answer. And Catherine, do you want to take down your um, share screen so people can see you see you better for your answers? Yep. Um, oh, it's so tricky. It's so tricky this year because uh, every other year we have advocated for full funding. The what's what the city is asserting in its budget notes right now is that the plan is fully funded. So what it considers adequate funding and um, and the yeah the number the number of actions that are in the short term plan um, are funded but unfortunately so many things in the short term plan are a staff study a report back um, they're not major physical actions and transformations to our city. So, so I think it, with the funding ask, I think we'll have to get a little bit more specific this year rather than asking for full funding. Um, and yeah. that, has, that has worked in previous years. So that's something that we'll, we'll be looking to hear about tomorrow um, mm -hmm. in the budget review and, um, and that we'll put in our briefing note. Yeah, oh, people have talked about the net zero by 2040 plan as being a plan for a plan. And it's up to us to say, we don't want a plan for a plan. We want the action. We want the action. So we want to really, we want them to feel the pressure. Um, this is not about being polite because it's too you know, easy for them to, they, they feel overwhelmed too, because they look at the huge city budget and they don't know how they're going to do it. And they don't want to raise taxes and they, you know, if they are going to talk about revenue tools at the executive committee, we should get that information out to you so you can depute at executive committee also about new revenue tools. Uh, the other thing I think that we, people can consider putting in their deputations is we need longer. They need to add an extra month to this budget review process. It needs to come out sooner. So there's more time for a public um, discussion and there should be more budget meetings in, in all the words. Uh, so that is something people can talk about the process as well as the content of what we're commenting on. Um, okay, so Colleen, did you have one more question? Yeah, there are several, but I think we will follow up. We'll definitely follow up with everyone um, with the answers that we don't get to. So the one that I think I'm gonna ask is, um, what if, like, what if the, the city says they need next year to plan? And that's why there's not um, a substantial amount in this, in this one. Mm -hmm. I kind of, I think I kind of covered that, but Catherine, if you want to add to it, you can. Yeah. Was the question, what is it that the city needs to plan? Well, how no. do we get past it being a plan for a plan, right? Yeah. Is that right, Colleen? Yeah. 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 So I think part of it definitely is filling those staff positions. Um, we're not going to be able to undertake the the magnitude uh, of this transition without um, significant staff resources who are going to plan and uh, and coordinate everything that the city has to do from its side. Um, 
and then and then things are just I yeah Mike mentioned it it's things are moving with the in the wrong direction on transit we're seeing transit service cuts right now so transit service decreasing which doesn't make any sense um you know we we're gonna need more better faster more reliable transit service because we need to see the modal shift from people using their personal vehicles getting into transit and active transportation it's complicated during covid but we need to be making the investments now to make sure that uh that people are returning to transit uh when when they can um and winning back ridership. That's something that our allies at TTC Riders have been speaking quite a bit about. Mm -hmm. And um, so we we can't be seeing service cuts at this point. Like the that, you know, the call was for 1.5 billion per year from the technical report. 1.5 billion per year. So that's and that's capital. So that's uh expanding the transit network. That's more vehicles that are you know, low emission vehicles, um, more frequent service. It's it's getting much, many, many, many more people onto transit. Yes, thank you. Uh, again, housing was 57% um, transit or transportation emissions are 30 something more percent. And um, those are the big ones to address, absolutely. And uh, we are going the wrong direction. They can't be allowed to, to do that. Um, okay, sorry, I'm taking up a bit of extra time here before we get right into how to do the deputations. We can um, uh, make sure that we answer the questions you had for Mike that we didn't get to and the questions that we have for Catherine that we didn't get to yet um, in the follow-up notes that you should have by Friday, hopefully early in the day. Um, and so you can register to depute and then um, take the weekend to get your deputation ready, but you do need to register ideally by Friday um, to, to, book your, to book your time. Um, we will talk about uh, the, the breakouts in, in just a couple of minutes, because I first want to just say, so Catherine, maybe, maybe take a note of the other questions that are there for you and we'll, we'll add those to the notes, okay? And just for a couple of minutes, we'd like to put up the um, a PDF about uh, Deputations 101 and just go through that briefly. Okay, so you, you normally are allowed three to five minutes and it, it probably will be three. If they have a lot of people on the list, it'll be three. So time yourself at home so you know what your um, how long it's going to take. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer when you're actually a little nervous and you're actually uh, speaking to the to the counselors, you want to speak directly to them. You want to uh, you want them to hear your main point, and they will relate to you as a person, telling a little bit of your personal story and why this matters to you. They know that it's it, people are really putting in their own volunteer time to come and speak to them, so that makes an impression. That in itself, so you want to be genuine and and somewhat personal, but also give your facts and be clear about the point that you're asking them for. Um, so maybe we could scroll down a little bit more and you will have this handout. So I'm just going to touch on the highlights because we want to make sure that, uh, okay, I'm not seeing it anymore. Did we lose it? The deputation thing. <laughs> there we go. Uh, yeah, there we are. The dates are January 24th and 25th. There's the place that you write to, the clerk. Uh, you want to make it personal. Introduce yourself and the ward that you live in because it's useful to them to know um, you know, who is your counselor? And hopefully that person will be listening. Um, people, uh, counselors do listen in, even if they're not on the budget committee. Um, and they will get your written uh, deputations. They'll be in a package, but you also can email your written deputation to your counselor and to the mayor to make sure they actually see it in their inbox. So, um, so could we scroll down just a little more? There's, uh, yeah, the introduction, the main body, and what you're asking for. Um, they may ask you questions. Most likely it would be a counselor who wants you to elaborate on a point. They're your friend. They're asking you for that. Uh, um, so, but uh, always know that you can say, I'm not sure. 
if you're asked a question <laughs> that you don't know the answer to. So don't let that uh, worry you. Um, and uh, you can, if you want to, email your deputation in. Uh, okay, so I think that is, is basically it for, for this, but we have a very small clip, I think a 40 second video clip, if we can bring that up and you can see what it's like to, um, to actually speak, given the fact that we're doing this all online now, this is what it looks like. This is from uh, last summer's deputations. Liz. Of decarbonization. The recently released net zero report by the International Energy Agency calls for an end to the sale of fossil fuel burning boilers by 2025. We would like to see a similar set of deadlines for the sale of emission generating equipment and appliances for the City of Toronto. Fourth, we don't see a timeline in the strategy for disconnecting public and private buildings from natural gas. A set of deadlines similar to those outlined in the IEA report should be in place for getting Toronto off natural gas. Fantastic, thank you. That's just a little brief clip from Liz giving her deputation and you can see the councillors are sort of half listening, but they're there and they have also the written one in front of them if you sent it to them. And there's a little clock in the corner, which is your time running down. And when that's out there, don't usually like to extend it. You might get another sentence in, but really you need to try and be ready to, to close up right on time because they don't really uh, permit extensions. Um, so that's basically the process. And I, I was only just gonna give one minute about, about the importance of also lobbying your counselor Get to know your counselor. If possible, talk to them personally about the budget and your concerns. You can leave a message in their office asking them to call you back, um, or you can ask if it's possible to have a meeting. Um, and we do have a few weeks. The timeline, we have the timeline, and that'll we can include that in our follow-up. Um, that they, they have a few weeks to kind of try to get the message through to them about what really matters to you in the budget. And remember. It's election year, so they're also hearing that message with regard to what to what you care about and why. They, they may not see just how urgent it is, but those of us who follow the climate and we look on our inboxes every day, um, we know um, just how urgent this is. We have to cut emissions, 65% uh, at the city by 2030, and that needs everybody working together. So it's gotta be real team effort. Um, so I will encourage you to think about that and we can hook you up with other people from your, um, from your ward if you're able to get a meeting, if you're interested in doing that, uh, but at least see if they will give you a call back and you can let them know personally what you care about. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there because we wanna give time for 15 minutes for uh, breakout groups. And then what we'll do is come back and, and like have two minutes to just close up to thank everyone for all the, the, the wonderful presentations and technical work, our team and all of that. And just to let you know what's happening next with Climate Pass. So if you can come back to the main room at the end of your small group for just like two minutes or so, please do so. Um, so in your small groups, just think about what you wanna focus on in terms of budget deputations and do keep it focused on, on that. Uh, each person should have two or three minutes in your small group, at least a couple of minutes and the facilitator will be there to help you go around um, and share. Um, so if that person knows a little bit about doing deputations, so if you have a question um, about the process, you can ask that too. Um, so I think that's enough. I hope that's enough. So maybe we could go ahead, Mark, and get into the groups and we'll pay 30 seconds. Well, we just finished a group um, with some really good discussion uh, about buildings, about transit, about methane leaks, uh, and about forestry. So forestry, uh, we're gonna get some more statistics, uh, sorry, figures from Mike Layton as to what can be asked for in the forestry. Um, for Julie, who's gonna be speaking for her um, high school group, I believe it is, eh, Julie? Uh, from Earl Haig, yes? Yeah, that's super, thank you for, and the, the youth voice is so important. When they see you, they're gonna listen even more than they listen to the rest of us because uh, they need to know this is about the future for you, you know, and your classmates. So it's really, really great that you're going to speak. That's really good. Yeah. 
Okay, so I think we have everyone back who's coming back right now. Um, so we will just take a moment to wrap up. Um, I would just ask if, if the, any facilitators have a 30 second comment from your group, uh, and then we'll make our closing comments. Um, Liz, you look like you're uh, unmuting there, go ahead. <laughs> Nothing is hidden from you. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was uh, going to say that, that we had a great group. Um, most of the people are either, are going to depute either uh, verbally or uh, in writing, and they already know what they're going to be yeah. talking about. It's a very knowledgeable group. So super. Yeah, they're fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Okay. Colleen, you're next. I just wanted to say I had a range of people in my group experience to first time deputation people and we had everything from a haiku shared with us on the spot to um, talking about what uh, kind of revenue tools we can push so I'm hoping in the follow up letter and with T's um, follow up we can send some uh, more information out after this meeting but that was a great discussion we had. Okay, super. Val, are you um, available to have your 30 seconds? There you go. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Our group of well, there are five of us, and I think everybody is pumped to do a, a in person or whatever a Zoom deputation, and some really uh, interesting angles. Uh, uh, and one reminded me um, that the counselors really like to hear unusual sort of creative uh, solutions, and there were a few of those in my group that I, I just thought uh, were great. Um, so to keep that in mind that, you know, if you, if you have something, um, it doesn't hurt to, to dream and be creative. Yeah. And to be unique because yeah. the, the, they really set up and listen if, if it's a new, a new angle. Right. Yes. So, um, I'm not sure if Catherine is still with us, um, or if anybody was in the group. Oh, there you are, Catherine. Okay. Go ahead. Do you want to have your 30 seconds? Tell us how your group went. Yeah, on the personal angle, we talked about uh, just, you know, everyone wanting to do their own part and and with a lot of a huge work area needed in uh, single family homes. And how do we green our own homes and that as a deputation angle to bring um, and specifically the city's role in that so this that the city needs to communicate to people about how to green your own home and the steps that you can take and what programs are available, how you can fund it, finance it, uh, and the, you know, how you can find out more about the technology. Uh, and then the city's role in, you know, matching people up with, um, you know, matching up homeowners with the folks that can help to do that work and the city's role in building that workforce too. Because uh, there's a lot of good green jobs to be generated and a lot of work to do. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, one personal angle that can tie both into your own home and doing your own, you know, your own part to help meet the city's climate ambition. Uh, and and then saying what the city needs to do yeah. to, to help you achieve that. Yeah, that's right. And you've also touched on the need for public education and outreach that people need to know uh, what they can do what, and how the city can help them do it. So that's really important as well. Um, and I'm not sure how that part is funded, which, which positions are gonna do that. We know Megan and Tamara are certainly outreach people for Transform to you and they're doing a fantastic job. So we want them to certainly continue and expand those programs. So I'm just gonna to, uh, hand it over to Colleen for a second to tell, to tell you what's next, what Climate Fast is doing next. And this is to do with the provincial election right now. Um, and then we're gonna thank, thank folks and uh, close up. So go ahead, Colleen. Okay, so I will be brief and I'll share in the chat as well. Um, we'll be sharing a survey, first of all, for you, you can do about this um, um, webcast, but we have two upcoming ones around uh, the kitchen table climate conversations and how we can talk about the climate and climate justice ahead of the provincial election. A lot of us are getting worried about the provincial election. So that's gonna be February 16th um, and March the 2nd. And we're hoping to help people feel empowered and able to spread awareness and build awareness 
um, pre-provincial election about how important it is to take action and to um, take equitable action and, and just like the transform PO um, program uh, lays out. Um, so that, that's going to be coming up. I'm also going to share in the chat um, our website address because you can sign up for the newsletter so you can stay informed um, about what's coming up if you'd like. So I'll share that now. Yeah. And uh, yeah, hope to see you there at, on some of our upcoming events. Thank you very much. We do end up working at all three levels of government, it seems, because we, we they all need a push, that's for sure. Uh, we thank you for coming out tonight to focus on what we can do at the city level. Uh, if you do have questions, don't hesitate to put them in the chat or reply um, to the emails that you've received, and we'll try to answer them in the follow-up. I'd like to thank our technical team tonight. So we had Ray Nakano, we had Mark, um, uh, Mark, uh, Shapland, and we had Lorna, uh, who is also our newsletter editor, uh, Lorna McHugh, and um, we had Priscilla. Priscilla was here helping as well, and um, Colleen was our chat monitor, and uh, Sharon uh, Bider helped and also did the survey for you. Um, so I think that's who was our tech team. And then um, our facilitators that are here tonight, you can see them right here. Uh, Liz and Colleen and Val and Catherine. And Catherine, of course, for giving us a, a, a really useful presentation, really informative. Um, and I, I don't think Mike is still with us, but of course we wanna thank Mike Layton for um, his part in bringing the issues to us. And again, thank you to all of you for coming out, standing up as citizens and saying, this matters to, to me. Uh, and I'm gonna take the time to write something and I'm going to deliver it. I'm going to either deliver it in writing or in person um, and, you know, have the confidence that we can make our electoral process and our civic democracy here in Toronto work for us for the future that we want to see. So thank you, everybody, for coming. If I missed anything in the closing, <laughs> or are we good? <laughs> are we good? Okay, so you can just uh, wave your goodbyes. Thank you. You can unmute and say goodbye if you like. If you can unmute, I'm not sure. But uh, thank you again, everybody. We appreciate every one of you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Thanks. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay. <laughs> Bye, everyone.